All right, last week we finished up chapter 14 from Doy Moyer's book, Mind Your Faith. And now we've moved on to chapter 15, Postmodernism. So we talked about the problem of hell, and now we're going on to postmodernism. In fact, this is a term that uh, we've noticed a couple of times already in these, uh, these chapters uh, in this book. And so moving into actually discussing what postmodernism is and, and how it is affecting society, how it's affecting us, by extension, with our efforts to serve God and to teach the gospel, uh, it's important for us to kind of see that this is a philosophy that is incorporated and ingrained in almost every facet of our society. Uh, postmodernism is basically it's the concept of post-truth. It describes a situation in which feelings trump facts, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And we see this being shown in just about every aspect of our society, whether it's uh, media coverage or uh, social media, people's reactions to events that take place. A lot of it isn't really about the facts. It's about the narrative. It's about the feelings. It's about other aspects to it. The more familiar term for this way of thinking is postmodernism. The nature of truth means it is objective. Truth isn't created by us, but rather discovered. Truth does not change to fit the whims of fallible people. And that's very important to note that when we talk about truth, we talk about that which is real, that which is reality. We're not just talking about people's perceptions of truth. We're not talking about people's definitions of truth necessarily. We're talking about that which is real, that which is incontrovertible. Whatever is objective truth is truth for everyone, everywhere. And especially as this applies to us as Christians, we're talking about God and his word. God is the ultimate source of truth. However, truth is often suppressed in unrighteousness, as Paul says in Romans chapter 1. And because the truth is suppressed in unrighteousness, it's not just telling lies instead, it's obfuscating. It's muddying up the waters to give the appearance as if there really isn't any truth at all. It's not just countering the truth. It's trying to make it where truth can't be seen or understood as well. Modernism typically refers to a mindset growing out of the Enlightenment period that places a premium on science and rational thought. We talk about modernism. We talk about kind of the... Uh, the advent of the, the scientific method and so forth. And, and that's focused on what's real. That's focused on facts. And it's, it's generally more through naturalistic scientific aspects. Though rational or through rational thought and the naturalistic scientific method, truth was seen as discoverable and knowable. So thus, postmodernism goes beyond this concept of discovering the truth to the truth can really be whatever you want it to be. Now, there's a battle between traditional reason and the postmodern denial that truth is objective. To the postmodernist, truth cannot be proved in any objective way because we are only able to express subjective feelings. Therefore, science, history, reason, and evidence cannot tell us anything except what those who report about it believe. I thought that was a really interesting point, that everything's now getting, fil now getting filtered through this uh, concept of, of well, what was the situation and, and how does this make you feel, how does this make me feel, what were the, the kind of the, the situations and the person that's reporting this or whatnot. And, and so it's not really about the truth, it's about the subjective aspects of the perception of what's so called Thoughts or comments? Yes, sir. Yes, it's really difficult, and I'm going to step outside of our religious discussion for a second to just in officiating sports. Now they can pick it. Who cares about the rules? Hmm. Like you're saying, how did we feel? How did we react? That's just, you know, that's how I'm reacting to it. Mm -hmm. Regardless if there's a rule book over here that says that's right, that's wrong, whatever. Right. So I
Now, and, and, and what's interesting about that, it's a great analogy, especially given the fact that you have a set of rules that you follow, and you have to follow, and, and those rules aren't subject necessarily, most of the rules aren't subject to interpretation, you know, especially like football, and it's, it's, it's funny to me, depending on, it doesn't matter whose side you're on, usually the home stadium, all the flags are against them. Okay, any, any flag that's against them, that's, that, was a, that was a bad flag. The refs, I don't know what they're looking at. And on the replay, you can clearly see there was a penalty or there was a false start or whatever it may have been. But the home crowd, they, no, that's not right. And it, it's interesting because the idea of having set objective rules is becoming less and less of a, of a thought process. And as it apl applies to sports, which require rules, otherwise, what's the point? Chaos, yeah, and, and the same is true for civilization. The same is true for a society as well. Any other thoughts through that? <clears throat> Since there is no absolute truth, then everything, including our morality, is relative and person dependent. Of course, we talked a couple chapters ago about the concept of morality and what happens if there's, uh, well, we, we talked about the, the problem of, of evil and suffering in the world, and we talked about morality in that perspective as well. There are no objective standards by which to judge anyone or anything. All ethical views should be tolerated, and this is ironically seen as absolute. And if you don't, tolerate anything or anyone, then what happens? If you actually have certain standards by which you judge yourself and by which you're told to judge the words and actions of others, people are intolerant towards you. Okay? Uh, Society is intolerant towards those who are intolerant of it, even though it preaches tolerance. Uh, traditional morality is seen as oppressive since the Bible is expressed in such absolute terms. Postmodernists reject its fundamental principles. It's okay to be religious, but it's not good to teach that your religion is the only way. All religious views are equally valid except the one that claims to be the one right way. I thought it was a, a really good observation to note, especially as it applies to morality and then by extension, obviously, God's word. The idea that if we say, because the Bible is absolute, okay, it does with, it deals with absolutes. The Old Testament, thou shalt not. <laughs> okay, there, there's, there's thou shalt and thou shalt not. Those are called commandments. And commandments is kind of, a, or commands are, are very... It's kind of a, a bad word in today's society. The thought process of absolutes is just not tolerated very well because people want to make their own rules. And in a lot of ways, religion caters to this desire. Okay, we've got what we call fast food religion. You can do it. You can find a church, a community church, whatever you want that will teach what you want, that will tolerate what you want to tolerate, and it will cater to your thoughts and your feelings instead of seeking to serve and please God. And that's part, that's part of the problem that we see of postmodernism's impact on religious society. Thoughts or comments through that? Yeah, no. Yeah, it's just, uh, whatever terminology, this thing you've been around for some years. I remember as a kid, I loved reading Sunday comics, comic strips. There's one, I can't remember the name, but it was set in a Western setting. And it seemed like once a month, the old cowpoke would ride by the Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, and this is not new. You know, the Gentiles in Romans chapter one, Paul describes their falling away from God to false idols and their reason or their kind of the process by which they fell away to false gods was because they wanted to do what they wanted. It wasn't about what God wanted. And so one thing led to another to the point where God gave them over. Okay. If I, I mean, I'm not going to force you to worship me. I'm not going to force you to obey me. And if you end up wanting to, to worship these false gods and, of course, incur the, the judgment that would come because of that, then that's their choice. But it came because they wanted what they wanted. They wanted their own gods. They wanted to do the things they wanted to do. 
And, and it, you're right, it's not new. Uh, the, the, especially, I think, in our society as it pertains to postmodernism, and the reason why that term is, is set that way is because of the, how just how permeated this thought has become in the idea that there's no fluid or there's no static truth. It's all fluid. It's all subjective. And if that's the case, then nothing's really real. Anything else through that? All right. So the first uh, little uh, heading or, or uh, denomination of the chapter that Doy brings up is the shift in thinking. This shift in thinking has affected all levels of society, education, including history and literature, religion, politics, science, medicine, law, I mean, you name it. And, and, and this, of course, keep in mind, Doy Moyer's writing this several years ago, and this has become even more, <laughs> more true in the last several years, even more so obvious. As Dennis McCallum put it, Unlike Darwinism, postmodernism isn't a distinct set of doctrines or truth claims. It's a mood, a view of the world characterized by a deep distrust of reason, not to mention a disdain for the knowledge Christians believe the Bible provides. It's a methodology, a completely new way of analyzing ideas. Uh, I think that's interesting. It's not just a deep distrust of reason, it's a disdain for the absolute nature of the truth of God's word. I think that's a very interesting kind of duality there that's defined there by Dennis McCallum. Uh, relativism says that truth isn't fixed by outside reality, but is decided by a group or individuals for themselves. Truth isn't discovered, but manufactured. Truth is ever changing, not only in insignificant matters of taste or fashion, but in crucial matters of spirituality, Morality and reality itself. So you've got these two terms, relativism, which is all based upon what a group of people decide or what an individual decides. And we see that what's what's kind of a, a big thing that we as Christians are dealing with in our society right now when it comes to relativism. What else has become very fluid lately? Gender. Yeah, gender. That there's not just male and female, but now you've got all the... It's not just sexuality that they're talking about. It's gender itself. There's binary, non-binary. There's, there's all these non-gender specific concepts, changing of pronouns and so forth. Because what you believe you are, therefore you are. It's a kind of a perversion of I am, therefore... Or I think I am, therefore I am. Uh, the idea of... I will choose to be what I want to be, and therefore, now you have to accept that, you have to respect that, uh, otherwise you offend me, and so forth. I just make up kind of my own category for myself. And we see that. that in fact, a lot of the websites that keep track of the different terms for sexuality, the different terms for genders, and so forth, they can't keep up with all of the different categories that are literally being made up every day different categories for different eventually there's going to be a different category for every individual because they don't want to be part of a of a group of other people they're going to have their own specific gender they're going to have their own sexuality and it's all based on their feelings their perceptions of truth lots of comments through that uh that quote yeah yeah in fact there's an article uh, I've been meaning to do a daily devotional about it, about a mom who writes in asking for advice about her, teen, about her child. I forget what, what age they were. I think they were 12 years old. But they were saying that, that, that they put on new sexuality, new genders every week, like changing clothes. And the mom is like, I want to support my child, but I can't keep up with all the changes in their pronouns and the changes in their thought processes and so forth. And I'm beginning to wonder if it's just kind of one of those things like it's kind of a fad. It's just one of those things that all their friends are doing. And so I want to too. And it's just kind of one of those things they say the words and they say these things, but they have no idea what they're talking about. And I thought that was very, <laughs> very interesting. The fact that this mother's like, you know, I, I, I don't understand how to keep up with this. How do I adapt? And it's, it's as if it's a whole, we talk about a whole new generation. It's literally a whole new 
new generation where there is no real truth there. And, and unfortunately, sometimes and in some places, this is actually being taught to them in school that that's the case. Yes, sir. Right. Well, you know, and we, yeah, yeah, right. It is intellectually lazy. And in a lot of ways, you think about, we've talked about emotion, especially the, the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is just, a, it's just, it's an attitude or it's a, uh, uh, an emotion that comes or goes. Sometimes you can be happy for a reason. Sometimes you're happy for no reason and vice versa. Sometimes you're unhappy for a reason and sometimes you're unhappy for no reason. And emotions are kind of, they're, they're fluid. They come, they go, they're influenced by a whole lot of different things. Whereas the state of joy, joy literally means blessedness or the recognition of being blessed. Okay, I can be unhappy and still be joyous. And a lot of people don't understand the distinction in that emotion sometimes has no basis at all for anything. Sometimes you simply feel a certain way. And, and for those of us, well, for those of you who have been pregnant, ladies, uh, you know this, okay? There were times Elizabeth would be laughing, and the very next second, she would be bawling her eyes out. And I'm going, what did I do? Because it had to be me. What did I do? What did I say? Nothing, I'm just pregnant. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, women definitely understand that. Fellas, we may be less so. But still, there's that emotional tide. And for young people especially, that is a major, major problem because of all the hormones that they're dealing with, especially once they hit puberty. And so there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of unknowns that they're going into, a lot of fear. And in a lot of ways, what our society has done has now taught them that instead of kind of seeing through the storm of emotion and hormones, focused on truth, focused on objectivity, now you let yourself be swayed to and fro. In fact, there are several warnings about that in the Bible. Being like children tossed to and fro with every wave of doctrine, Ephesians 4. And, and being stable, being focused amidst emotion and strife and so forth, that helps ground people. It helps ground young people. And without that, they're just... They're just Boats without an anchor in a storm. Anything else? Yes, Nolan. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, you know, there's, it's one thing to be said to examine other methodologies to determine what's the best way to teach and the best way to learn. It's another thing to completely ch change the, the uh, paradigm where it's not about learning truth. It's about exploring feelings or exploring experiences. Uh, and one thing that, that DOI, of course, it wasn't quite as big a deal a couple of years ago, but it is now, is a, a lot of the, what's being, rephrased, what's being phrased as anti-racism, in particular, the concepts that are included in mathematics and the, 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 the thought process that mathematics by its nature is racist because of the desire to find the right answer in math. That's in some ways being taught in schools that math isn't about finding the right answer. Now, I don't know to what extent that goes. Does that mean that we're saying that two plus two can equal four or three or five? I don't know. But what, does that gonna, what is that gonna produce in students who learn that perhaps one of the most fundamental absolutes in the world, mathematics, maybe isn't as absolute as I thought? 
That, it just it, it boggles the mind where some of these things are permeating and taking on different phrases to give them kind of a sense of righteousness. Okay, anti-racism. Well, nobody wants to be racist. Nobody wants to think that way. And nobody wants to consider themselves racist. However, if you aren't anti-racist, you are racist. And this goes in a lot of different aspects to it as well. Whether it's economics, politics, you either are, you accept all of this together. Uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, who was the one who wrote the Harry Potter books, She's been very vocal in support of the homosexual, gay, lesbian community and so forth. But she's been canceled <laughs> by most of them because of her statement that she believes there's only two genders, male and female. Okay, that's all, that's all she says. She's supportive of LGBTQ plus and all that stuff. But she says there's only two genders, male and female, and everybody lost it. Never mind the fact that she's supportive of almost everything else. When it comes to transgenderism, if you aren't all on board with everything we think and say, then you, you can't be with any of it. And it, it just goes to show, in a lot of ways, exactly what Doi is describing here. This postmodernistic thought that there is no truth until you say something that counters what I believe. Well, then my truth is more important than yours. You believe there's only two genders. I don't think there are any genders or that there's a of them, and my truth is more important than your truth. I mean, and, and it's showing in every aspect of our society. And in, it's, it's more and more relevant to understand how this is permanent and how we as Christians have to kind of, kind of navigate through these problems. Any other thoughts or, or uh, uh, questions with that, that quote? In this way of thinking, there are at least two ideas that permeate everything. First of all, all morals and ideas are relative. And second of all, we should tolerate most ideas and practices, except for those views that say we shouldn't tolerate everything. In other words, to be found acceptable, we must agree with relativism. Uh, Beckwith and Kokel observed in 1998, this is, this is 98, this was 23 years ago? What year is it now? 21? Yeah, 23 years ago or so, okay? Today, we've lost the confidence that statements of fact can ever be anything more than just opinions. We no longer know that anything is certain beyond our subjective preferences. The word truth now means true for me and nothing more. We've entered an era of dogmatic skepticism. 23 years ago, they're making this observation in the society. Now, I was too young, really, to fully see all the stuff that was going on, I guess, because I don't remember the state. Of course, our state of our society is a lot different now, 23 years later. But even it was being shown. It was being seen. Uh, and then the, the next quote from these same guys, truth dies, all of its subspecies, such as ethics, perish with it. If truth can't be known then the concept of moral truth becomes incoherent. Ethics become relative. Right and wrong matters of individual opinion. This may seem a moral liberty, but it ultimately rings hollow. The freedom of our day, lamented a graduate in a Harvard commencement address, is the freedom to devote ourselves to any values we please on the mere condition that we do not believe them to be true. I thought that was a really interesting quote coming from the uh, Harvard commencement, a Harvard commencement uh, address from a graduate to make that statement that the freedom of our day is the freedom to devote ourselves to any values we please. Okay, most people would say that's great, but the condition of that is that we can't believe that they're true, because the moment you say they're true, well, all of a sudden you're excluding other other people who think different things, other trains of thought. In this way of thinking, tolerance is required because no one is in a position to say that anyone else is wrong. Right and wrong are judgmental terms that are more rooted in absolutist ideas. I love how Doy threw that in there, that phrase, absolutist ideas, kind of 
showing and, and kind of conveying the fact that that word, that term or that phrase, absolutist, would be seen as kind of a, that's a derogatory concept in today's society. Okay, that is a, that is a, if you're an absolutist, you might as well be a racist or anything else. An absolutist is someone who believes that there are absolute truths to reality, or for that matter, about God or anything else. The Bible is absolutist. Thoughts or comments to that? All right, signs of the times. There are several indicators of postmodern concepts. I think there's five of them that Doy brings up. Political correctness generally refers to the idea that we should uh, that we should get out of our way. Or should, oh, sorry, we should go, not got. That we should go out of our way not to offend certain groups. While Christians should be sensitive to others, not trying to offend. Political correctness takes matters into the moral realm. For example, calling homosexuality a sin. Calling something a sin is not politically correct as it implies a spiritual standard to which all are amenable or held to. Uh, I think that's a, a pretty interesting point. You know, a lot of times political correctness, we sometimes, especially in we think of political correctness sometimes as more political thing. But really... Political correctness is a societal thing. It doesn't just have to do with politics. It's anything. And the moment at you do as Jesus commands in John chapter 7 to judge according to righteous judgment, okay, not according to appearance, but according to righteous judgment, when you take all the facts, you take everything, and then take God's word, which defines right and wrong, and then apply God's word to that situation. That's righteous judgment. Okay, so homosexuality, which is condemned in places like Romans chapter 1 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, or I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, these concepts that are being described in society's terms, that's, how, that is, that's terrible that you could possibly say that. I mean, how, how dare you not make a judgment on the soul? And in some cases, not even give your own commentary to it. My brother, actually, my brother had a, had a, a, a friend at school who was homosexual. And all he did was quote a scripture. He did not offer any commentary or anything else to it. He just quoted a scripture and she immediately said, why are you judging me? And Donnie says, I just quoted scripture. That, that's all I did. I'm not offering my thoughts here. I'm telling you what God's word says. <laughs> That's it. And, and, but it's, it's the, in, the impression that people receive that if you say something's right or something's wrong and they don't believe the same thing, well, then you're not politically correct, especially if it doesn't go according to what the majority or the, however people want to phrase political correctness, however people determine that, what people are willing to tolerate, uh, especially if you go against that. Of that. Secondly, we are expected to accept an aspect of multiculturalism and pluralism that allows for any and all diversity, even if it goes against biblical morality. Now, careful point. Doe's not saying that multiculturalism is wrong. Okay, we're the United States is made up of all kinds of combinations of cultures. But when you start, especially as in some cultures, when you start saying, well, that these certain paths in life that some cultures think are fine, now that applies to everybody else too. You have to think it's okay as well. The idea of pluralism, that everybody's right. Nobody can say anybody else is wrong. That's what Doy is describing. If it goes against biblical morality and you say, well, Okay, I, I appreciate the fact that you come from this culture that thinks it's right, but God says it's not. Okay, that, that's, all you, that's all you have to say to end up being, to being shunned and canceled in our society. Thoughts or comments through that one? Noah?
Oh, it was on your shunned. Yeah. Yeah. If, if it offends them or isn't my way of thinking, right. then the inclusion that's still being preached is out the door. It goes out the door. Instead of inclusion, now it's exclusion because you don't go along with what we say. And and again, a lot of times, in fact, when I was reading through the, the chapter, I had to remind myself because some of the stuff he brought up kind of made me a little uncomfortable because it felt political. But then the more I thought about it, the more I realize what his point is, is, is that these issues, this is, this is his point. It permeates everything to the point that what we have deemed in a lot of, in our minds, maybe as being political, it's simply a sign of the times. It shows the postmodernistic thought process that has permeated all sort, all sorts of areas of our, of our society, that it's not political. It's not one party versus another party or one type of people versus another type of people. It goes to the thought of our lives, how we view truth, and whether or not we can say that there is any truth. And if we do, can we say it's true for me, but it doesn't have to be true for you? Declining educational standards is the next one. Improving self-esteem rather than simply learning as well as fostering the student ideas of the learning experience, as, as Nolan mentioned. Again, it, and understand where Doyle's coming from. He's not saying that seeking to improve student self-esteem is a bad thing. What he's saying is devoting, instead of something true, history, math, whatever it may be, more and more time is being devoted to letting kids kind of explore their selves, explore their experiences, their emotions, and so forth. Those are the types of maybe situations and jobs that parents should take, whereas schools should be teaching. And again, that's one of those things that I think, well, that's kind of more of a political type of thing. But Dewey's point is that this is not a political thing. It's postmodernism. It's the concept that there is no truth. It's all about just kind of me and my emotions and my experiences. It, it, it isn't political. It's ideological. Although sometimes those are hard to separate, it's ideological. Thoughts or comments through that one? The next one, viewing history and literature, history is no longer a record of events. It is simply how certain people perceived those events. History is fluid. Literature is no longer about what the author was intending to convey, but rather how we can subjectively determine our own meaning and how it makes us feel. And I thought that was kind of an interesting point that Doy makes as well about the idea of, of, of reading literature and understanding period pieces that are celebrated for their uh, insight into Victorian times or whatever it may have been. And instead of looking at it from those, that lens, people look at it from a, a modern day lens. And that's not entirely fair of looking at that, much less you're kind of missing the point of the, of the literature. I want to go back and have a number of my English lit pictures to be great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sure saw it one way. And yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I can remember, I can remember several references in, in reports that I would do book reports, you're inputting your own thoughts here. This is not in the, in the manuscript or in the, in the book. And I remember several times, well, but still that's what I thought about when I, so I figured it was valid. No, it's not valid because it's not in the manuscript. It's not in the literature. Well, now today, oh, it, it, it's more valid because it's, it's subjective to you. It's made of what it made you feel. The next thing, the ty this type of philosophy has obvious potential ramifications to our Bible studies and religious practices. Trying to understand what the writer of a passage meant when he wrote something, our focus becomes what a text means to us, regardless of what it originally meant. That is incredibly crucial as Christians that we recognize that difference. There's a term we use for that. We have to appreciate what? The context, okay? The co context is a lost, it, it's really becoming a lost art. 
in today's society in just about anything, much less God's word. 1 Corinthians 15.33 is a great example of this. Even Christians, when they read 1 Corinthians 15.33, a lot of, especially younger people, have been taught evil communication corrupts good morals. And they've been taught that what that means is, what? Be careful how you choose your friends. Okay, Evil communication corrupts good morals. That's what that means. And so when they read that, that's what they read. But what's the context of verse 33? False teachers. That's what the context is. People who were teaching that there is not a resurrection of the dead. And yet, Paul says, you've allowed these individuals to corrupt you. Now, take that a step further to the principle being applied. Paul's applying the principle of how evil influences can affect Christian understand, understanding of what, of what God says. Now, take another step to reapply that principle. It can evil influences be, even be in the forms of friendships that we have? That's what Paul would call uh, unequally yoked to the Corinthians. Do not be unequally yoked to non-believers. Allowing your relationship, your friendships with people to have an unequal effect on you, causing you to compromise your faith. Because that's what was happening. And so context, understanding that context is crucial. It's important. You have to take those steps. Just like in math, at least used to be, you had to show your work. I hated that. Because a lot of times I would get to the answer without having to go through all the little steps. It just irritated the mess out of me. And I would get in so much trouble. You have to show your work. Well, I don't know. I don't want to show my work. You have to go through the work. Okay. You establish the context. What's the point or application the writer is making? The, what's the principle that they're utilizing to make that point? And then how else can that principle be applied? There are three three step process. Rather than just jumping to well, what this what this verse means is be careful how you choose your friends. That's one application, but it's not what it means. And I think that's very important to what what uh, Doi is talking about here. Thoughts or comments through that? Yeah, it's about, yeah, it's about digging deeper. Uh, it, or instead of pleasing God in worship, our focus is on how we feel. So we are more prone to worship as we like and not as God has authorized. I thought that was a great point as well. Because we see that in religious society where it's about the experience. Okay, I forget the name of the church down here uh, off of Kemp. Uh, it's at Kemp and Avenue H, I think, or Avenue K. Uh, there's that, that church there, and they always have these interesting little signs uh, up for these different uh, themes that they're doing for that month. I think it's every month they do a different theme. But it's, it's, it's all about the experience. That's what they advertise. It's all about the experience. And it just goes to show that religious society isn't about truth of God's word. It's about feeling good, feeling better, feeling justified, doing what I want. And yet still feeling like I'm okay for doing what I want. That, and that is a lot of the effort of community churches. These churches that have thousands and thousands of people who are members. A lot of those churches, the majority of those churches, that's what it's all about. It's about emotion. It's about experience. It's not about what God says. Nolan? Yeah. 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 A lot of times those, what, what some, some people refer to as fluff lessons or, or puff lessons just kind of make people feel better. And, and there's, a, there's a time and a place for sermons that are just designed to uplift. Okay. It doesn't all have to be fire and brimstone and, and judgment. There, there are sermon times you can just preach on God's love or just preach on this or that. And that's fine. But you have to preach the whole counsel of God, as Paul told the Ephesian elders that he did. Anything else? The postmodern problem. Postmodern thinking cannot logically be maintained. If they proclaim there is no such thing as truth, ask 
<laughs> that statement is true. <laughs> so Dewey goes through a couple of, of logical problems with this thought process. When he says, there, when, if they say, there's no such thing as truth, it's all fluid. Well, how can I believe you? Because it's like saying, I always lie. Okay? Well, if I'm lying right now about always lying, does that mean I'm telling the truth? But if I'm telling the truth, then there's no truth, I'm lying. It's one of those circular things that you, you kind of get into. They say there's no truth, but are, what, is what they're saying true? If there's no truth? If they insist, don't push your morals on us, ask them if they're their morals on you by telling you what you should and shouldn't do. Okay, I'm not supposed to push my morals on you, but why are you pushing your morals on me? Your lack of, or lack of res as restrictive maybe, or whatever. If they tell us that language cannot be understood objectively, ask them what they mean by that. Okay, well, if, if language can't be understood objectively because it's all subjective emotions, that's the only way we can express ourselves, well, explain what you mean by that objectively. They can't. Why? Because they can only express themselves in subjective emotions. They cannot explain it because it's not objective. <laughs> And I, I love that Doi kind of goes through those points to show the absurdity of the thought process. It's not making fun of it. It's showing that this is how absurd this is. To take relativism at, to its conclusion, how can they say that anything at all is right or wrong? If they have no standard of judgment, who is to say that doing anything you feel like, even to the destruction of others is wrong. The example he brought up was torturing a child. I would say that's wrong. Why? On what basis? If it makes someone else feel better, if it makes the torturer feel good, on what basis can you say what he's doing is wrong? There was an article, I guess it was last week, about attempt to redefine pedophiles as minor attracted people. Instead of being called pedophiles, minor attracted people. In an effort to normalize, in an effort to destigmatize the concept. That's, I think that's exactly the point that Doi's making. Because what happens is, if you say that it's, all that matters is what you feel and that makes it okay for you, well, why don't you have murderers and pedophiles and all these individuals making the claim, it's true for me, it makes me feel good? Who are you to say what I'm doing is wrong? And really, there is no basis for them to say that. If they're rejecting God's word, there's no standard of judgment there. There's no standard of right and wrong. Thoughts or comments through that one? For reality to mean anything, truth is unavoidable. The law of non-contradiction is that something like a word or an object cannot be both what it is and what it isn't at the same time and sense. Okay, you, you can't have something be what it is and what it isn't at the same time. That's, that's the law of non-contradiction. If postmodernists are going to make arguments and write articles, they too must assume the truth of that principle. Otherwise, why talk and write about it at all? But then it loses all meaning if you say this is and isn't the truth. Well, then why? Why bother, right? All right. We will stop there. We will pick up and finish, uh, Lord willing, chapter 15 next Sunday. Thank you, everybody, for the thoughts and comments.